Welcome to the video lecture on the story The Vein of Memory by K R Meera. K R Meera is one of the most vibrant writers in contemporary Malayalam literature. Her works are noted for its fearless stance and closely examine the power dynamics of a patriarchal society. She is defiantly political in her perspectives and her works mirror her commitment towards developing a meaningful societal dialogue through her characters. Her noted works are Ormeda Nyaramba which came out in 2002, Mohamanya in 2004, Ave Maria in 2008, Meera Sadhu again in 2008 and Arachar in 2012. Arachar is considered to be her magnum opus. She has won several awards like Kerala Sahitya Academy Award, Kendra Sahitya Academy Award, Vailar Award and Odakural Award. So I'll read the text for you and then we'll go to the analysis. The Vein of Memory Her voice was like rusted hinges grating. A violet colored vein stood out challengingly on her wrinkled neck. straightening her spectacles a bit the old woman asked without any particular introduction do you write dear the girl did not answer she simply looked at her quite by chance her eyes rested on the old woman's head half her scalp was visible with some stray black strands scattered over it there was a meeting which varlathol attended before independence the old woman said On pronouncing the word independence her dentures jutted out pathetically the girl felt a kind of revulsion as if to hide her uneasiness she twisted and turned to the folds of the light blue chunni of her churidar what was independence in those days wasn't everyone literally mad over it the nylon and nylex clothes were all burned we would wear only khadar i had a sari with the black border even wearing sari was very fashionable the girl shifted her glance to the bookshelf since it vexed her to watch the old woman tying her dentures back to its original position on the topmost rack of the shelf were some old framed photos a black and white photo of someone garlanding somebody at a reception towered authoritatively over the others the rest appeared moth eaten water stained family photos on the second and third racks there were only a few notebooks the girl looked once again at the old woman inadvertently i wrote a poem when beliama asked me to and read it at the meeting the sweet scent of the flowers of imagination in our humble gardens too when she uttered the word sweet scent the old woman's dentures protruded in her effort to sing the poem tunefully her cracked sound strained quite a lot it became a groan as if somebody had gripped her throat the mahakavi she joined her hands in salutation with awe and respect as if she saw varlathol before her he called me to him placed both his hands on my head and blessed me saraswati saraswati herself the old lady tenderly stroked her own head which varlathol's hands had touched the girl discovered with chagrin that there were other black strands beneath her gray hair the room smelt of a stick of sandalwood incense which had long since burned down a hot breeze madly entered the room creating havoc a steel flask on the table with its faded tablecloth shivered lightly the ounce glass nearby fell and rolled away the odor of some medicine immediately filled the air In spite of all this the girl had begun to light the room filled with many smells this must be the most airy room in this house so as the story begins the young girl and the old woman are seen as near strangers though they are living in the same house they share no connection later from the story we infer that the old lady Uh, is probably the grandmother in law of the young girl but at this point they share no particular bond the young girl is mildly repulsed by the old lady and her 
dangers whenever the old lady speaks the dangers keep coming out and the young girl doesn't like seeing this the characters have no names and they have no interest in each other's lives they are both lost in their own worlds at the beginning of the story the old lady is lost in the foggy avenues of a life that has lost lost its lucidity its clarity and the young woman is indifferent to the old lady's reminiscences i was just 9 years old then the old woman was reminiscing but not like the present day girls had the growth of a 16 year old my husband had seen me at that meeting and she abruptly put an end to what she was saying then carefully broke off a white thread that stood at the edge of her neeriyada she was wearing a munda and neeriyada with a narrow red border her worn looking white blouse was crumpled the old woman got up as if greatly perturbed it was towards the shelf in the corner of the room that she moved unsteadily she sat down on a chair near the shelf and leafed through each book with intense concentration the girl had the feeling that the chair was a permanent fixture there and it was the old woman's practice to sit there when she handled her books not this it is a book with a red cover opening a book the old woman said with great excitement the girl shuddered when the old woman ruffled the pages of the book again the fine dust rising from it made the girl want to sneeze it was without the least sympathy that the old woman looked at the girl then i do had this at times she opened another book wasn't that why that book was lost due to the sneezing i had grown too lazy to keep the old newspapers children's books and such things in order it was amidst all this this book somewhere somehow my husband would get angry if any old paper was seen anywhere around everything should be kept in order no paper or dust was to be seen anywhere in the room the room had to be swept clean every day all the time her breath trembled who could foresee that such a need would arise in old age that touched the girl's heart she was right who could foresee she closed that book and took another when i wrote the first story my husband was in jail those were days when communists were arrested on sight on saying story the old woman's false teeth shook horribly irritated the girl got up and went to the window she tried to smoothen the strands of hair that had swept across her face in the strong breeze that had blown in again the sindoor she had put on her simandarega in the morning soaked in the sweat stuck to her finger it clung there for a second like a drop of blood then slowly fell off and died the old woman was opening yet another notebook raman kutti's old notebook the story written in the light of a lamp lit at the corner of this room away from the sight of the mother of this house the mother here used to get enraged if she saw someone reading or writing what use would it be to the family she would ask she turned the pages of the book slowly when he said that he liked the girl who read the poem at the meeting it seems it created a furore isn't that right what use are stories and poems like mother says girl should cook give birth to babies she turned the pages slowly my husband was the one who named raman good he said let him grow like rama i like the name ravindranath then then i thought let his wish prevail why simply quarrel whether ravindranath or raman good is it my son my own so i did not think of any name for shri kuti too he named her shri kuti i had told raman kuti when you have children if it is a boy name him ravindranath and if it is a girl rinalini isn't tagore's given name ravindranath and his wife's rinalini when it was time to say rinalini the girl hastily looked away even so the girl had started feeling a kind of kinship with the old woman the first story was about a lady who went to jail in the struggle for independence when the word independence was spelled the girl pursed up her lips and secretly felt her teeth with her tongue were any loose the old woman opened another notebook hid that carefully to read out to my husband but a few days after he came back from jail when i said that i had written a story the girl looked on eagerly the old woman's face had grown dim in a hurry she put that book back in place and took another 
Hmm. It was a book like this, a blue lined book, just like this one. I had written OM at the top and started writing. At the top of the second story, I wrote Sri Ramajay. When I was writing the second story, my husband was in Delhi, an MP. She closed the book and kept it on the shelf. I wanted so much to see Delhi, but he didn't take me. The answer every time was later, later. Time passed. Once during the long vacation, he took mother and children to see Delhi. If I too were to go, who would look after the cows? Who would light the lamp at father's astitara? These were mother's questions. Anyway, I could never go. I never did. As if divulging a dangerous secret, the old woman leaned towards the girl. That was when I wrote the second story. Now the girl became more interested in the old woman. What was that about? She queried. A woman writer. She writes stories under a male pseudonym and sends them to magazines. At last, one of her stories is awarded a prize and people come searching for her house. Oh, knowing about that, her husband said, Oh, it was indeed a story that I wrote. The old lady laughed, showing her small false teeth. Desire, <laughs> what desires? Slowly, as the old woman narrates her tragic tale, and you see that in this story, there are a lot of silences and incomplete sentences. And when this old lady is narrating her story, young girl is slowly drawn to her. The old woman's tale is one that is fairly common in a patriarchal society. A talented woman who's robbed of agency. She's supposed to sacrifice everything in the name of family. Her marriage was fixed without her consent. Her desires are crushed in the name of authority. Even when something as simple as having the freedom to choose one's na child's name, it is something that is denied to her. She is expected to be an automaton, fulfilling the wishes of the others in the family. She is not meant to have a voice or opinion of her own. The creative spirit in her is squashed mercilessly. And what is the reason given? You see that in page 112. The mother-in-law says, girl should cook, give birth to babies. That's all that a woman is supposed to do. Nothing more than that. So you see here the vicious clutches of patriarchy and how it, this is perpetuated not just by men, but women as well. The mother-in-law is dictating the limits of her existence. She has to hide her stories as she is not expected to be creative or intelligent or talented. The husband might have taken credit for her creative outpourings and she has to bear that again in silence. And as the old woman searches for her notebook of life, the young girl slowly understands that the patriarchal shackles are encircling her as well. That is why the girl makes a reference to the Sindhu that clung like a drop of blood. You see that sentence in page 112. Now we come to the last part of the story. When she replaced the book and took another, the girl wished to learn the rest of the story. What about the third story? She inquired. The old woman was about to take another book. At that instant, Parmakshi came through the doorway holding some vessels. Then you may, oh, have you begun studying for the exams again? Parmakshi asked loudly, mockingly. It is so long since you started studying. When is this going to end? Looking at the girl, she winged as if to a small child. Then she placed the vessels on the table. Kanye in a small vessel, a broad steel plate with rounded edges to pour it out and drink. Two papadams in another small plate. Veliame, don't you want any food? Come, take the kanye. Take your medicine for the afternoon, sleep, afternoon and sleep for a while. I'll swab your body as soon as you wake up. Don't raise your voice, girl, the old woman chided gently. I can hear, you know. Oh, so I am at fault. The thick muscles on Patmakshi's face moved contemptuously. She turned to the girl. Mole, why didn't you go for the wedding? She spoke accusingly. Didn't Srimon persuade you a lot? Won't everyone be eager to see the new bride? The girl did not reply. 
old lady simply laughed. The girl was interested in hearing the rest of the story, but the old lady was silent. She took the kanyi padma she poured for her. Then she walked to the wash basin. Removing her false teeth, she washed them and put them in a glass near the basin. Then wiping her hands and face with a towel on the stand, she came walking slowly. She took the glass of water and the tablet that Patmakshi had given, had taken from the bottle on the table and was holding out to her. The girl could see the difficulty with which the tablet and water were going down the wrinkled throat. The tablet engaged in a fight with that thick violet vein. Then it gradually disappeared. The old lady gently lay on the bed. The girl's curiosity to hear the rest of the story was increasing. She had an old book, has been searching for it ever since she lost her memory, Padmakshi said secretly. She would climb up the attic and go down to the cellar to search for it. Finally, fed up with this, Radeji gave her some old books of Sri Moon and Minimur. That turned out to be a relief. She would spend her time turning them over. The girl could not help sighing. You come along more... Now Veliyama will sleep. She lied like this till five in the evening. When she collected the vessels and went out, the girl stood, not sure what to do. The third story, she repeated unknowingly. The old lady forced open her drooping eyelids and with great difficulty determined the girl's location in that room. Then, smiling cruelly, said, unnatural death. The girl could not comprehend. The old lady touched the violet vein on her neck. When you tie the nose, it should tighten here on this vein. Who knew that? The girl's body trembled under the influence of an emotion akin to fear. Don't err on the wine. Vain, she reminded, closing her eyes. If you go wrong, you will lose your memory. The old woman did not say anything again. When Srijit returned late that night, the girl was standing before the mirror inspecting her outstretched neck. What are you looking for? He asked in, an, in the irritated tone of a lord who had not received due respect. A vein, she replied agitatedly. The vein of memory. So as the girl's interest in the old woman grows, so does her anxiety of how her life too will be shaped in the patriarchal world. The servant Patmakshi remarks about the old lady relentlessly searching for her notebook after she lost her memory. And the casual statement belies the poignancy of the tragedy. She is searching for a lifetime's worth, a book into which she poured her dreams and desires. But for others, she is just a crazy woman searching for an old notebook. And to appease her, what do they do? They just give her an old school notebook. Radeji just gives her old school notebooks of her children so that the old woman won't go searching for the book in the attic or the cellar and fall down and cause complications. They do not understand her anguish or pain and they don't care. It is this indifference that is more painful than her loss of memory. Not only did the society stifle the writer in her, they also took away the notebook that was part of her identity. As the story ends, the young girl is made aware of the old lady's unsuccessful attempt at committing suicide. And what is the old lady's final piece of advice? It scares the young girl. The old lady says, carefully note the crucial vein, the violet vein. And this advice is highly pertinent because if she fails, she is doomed to a life without memories. And that is infinitely more tragic than death. The young girl realizes that the patriarchal noose is dangling above her head. And her husband is just another agent of patriarchy, expecting her to keep aside her desires for him. You see towards the end, he is irritated that she is inspecting her neck and not paying attention to him. So it is imperative that the young girl also find the vein of memory because otherwise she will lose her identity. Let's take a look at the setting of the story. The story shifts between the past and the present. The past is a broken narrative filled with 
meaningful silences and incomplete utterances. The faded memories of the old lady give glimpses of the traumatic past. Though her memory is vague and fleeting, the old woman struggles to hold on to a few cherished remembrances. The present time, on the other hand, uh, is set in the room of the old lady, a room which is described as having many smells. The girl finds herself drawn to this room despite its faded tablecloth and musty books. The old lady is confined to this room and you can see that it is both her prison and her solace. Moving on to the characters, we have the old lady and the young girl. The old lady is quite a tragic figure. She is a victim of patriarchal condition. Her creative spirit is cruelly put out by her husband and his family. She is confined to the four walls of the house and she is expected to work like a slave. She is not offered love or gratitude. Instead, she becomes accustomed to a life where she is not expected to voice any desires. She wanted to go to Delhi, but she was never taken there. In fact, the children and the mother-in-law were taken to Delhi and she was expected to stay back because the cows had to be taken care of. All the household duties had to be taken care of. So she could never have any independent desire of her own. Her aspirations are crushed. It is hinted that her husband took credit for her stories. And in the end, what happened? She's met, made into a muddled old woman with vague memories and she's persistently searching for her notebook. It is again hinted that she tried to commit suicide out of her sheer frustration and anguish. But she's again defeated by fate and she loses her memory. You can say that she's the perennial victim, one who is robbed of her identity, individuality and creativity. Then you have the young girl who is at first a very disinterested spectator. But as the true tragedy of the old lady's life is revealed through the three stories, the young girl sees herself in the old lady. She thinks that, you know, my life could also be like this. She realizes that her life is also dictated by a patriarchal society and understands the significance of the vein of memory. Though times have changed, the fetters of a patriarchal world remain the same. Let's take a look at the major themes. The first theme is the suffocation of the female self. The old lady is not allowed to pursue her passion for writing under the pretext that a woman's duty is bound to her family. Her dreams are trampled on and her identity is forcefully tied down to that of a wife and a mother. She is not allowed to take decisions for herself. She is expected to fulfill the expectations laid down by a patriarchal society that determines the parameters of her existence. Even something as simple as having the freedom to name her son is denied to her and then she, her thought process is like you know why should i fight uh, let his, let my husband's wish prevail so she is constantly expected to give way to the desires of others and more tragic is that her writings are casually discarded and no importance is accorded to her imaginative power her husband takes credit for her stories and even that is normalized by a world that doesn't respect her right to express herself. And throughout the narrative you see this idea of why should a woman write? The mother-in-law keeps on saying the woman should only produce babies or cook or do the household work. Other than that a woman is not supposed to do anything else. So in the end the old lady is reduced to a pathetic woman vaguely searching for the remnants of her past. The next theme is the role of the ideal woman. The old lady narrates her hardships and she makes repeated references to the role that was expected from her. She was expected to do household uh, duties and to produce babies. Her desires are never actualized because she was never allowed to have desires. 
She wished to go to Delhi, but then what about the household duties? She longed to publish a story, but then who asked her to write? A woman is not supposed to write. What use are stories and poems? This is the line that the mother-in-law says. What good will it do to anybody? The young girl also realizes that she too is expected to conform to the standard of an ideal woman. When she doesn't immediately acknowledge her husband, he too gets impatient. Thus, you can say that the cycle of oppression it continues generation after generation. Now, the symbols uh, in the story. The first symbol is the notebook. The notebook symbolizes the old lady's most cherished treasure. It is a slice of her identity, her creative spark. She keeps on hunting for the notebook as she wishes to reclaim that self that had been priced away from her. It is rather tragic to note that she never gets back her notebook. Her family fools her with some musty old notebooks and she, she is seen searching relentlessly for her identity as a writer. Then you have uh, the vein of memory. As the old lady wants the young girl, the vein of memory is crucial. Once your memories are lost, your identity too will be lost. It is better to die than live a life like that. The old lady conveys the anguish of her existence and cautions the young girl against such a tragedy. I hope all of you have understood the story. Thank you.